Hello, I'm Dr. Russell Libby, and I welcome you to the world of medicine. On this show, we learn about important topics in healthcare medicine from an audience that participates. They answer questions, they tell us their experiences, they give us their thoughts on issues. Today's topic is a big one. It's food and food and how it affects us, our mind, our body, our self-image. You know, in this country, food has become such an important element, both from a commercial, but as well as a physical and health-related perspective. I mean, obesity, we know people who eat too much are going to have some major problems with their health as the years go by, and we see an incredibly increasing population of kids who are overweight. What are we going to do about it? Well, that's one issue we're going to talk a little bit about. We're also going to talk about how the modeling of image related to food and body shape influences kids. We have a lot of kids in the audience today. We're going to talk to them about what that might be and what that effect that might have on them. We're also going to talk about some of the unusual things that might happen with people while they have eating issues. Uh, some things you might have heard of like anorexia, bulimia, uh, compulsive eating, binging, purging, all those kinds of things. We're going to try to touch on all of them. We're going to try to help give you some insights as to what kinds of symptoms people might have if they are experiencing some abnormalities in the way they eat and the way they perceive themselves. So the first thing I want to ask you all is basically, I know how I feel and I never feel quite right about my body relative to what I'd like to look like. Anybody here really feel like they're just the perfect size and shape for their body, for what they want to look like? I don't see anybody saying, yeah, me. You know, and it's one of those things I think that, that people start very young in life. They start to think, I want to look a certain way, and I'm going to spend a lot of my time and energy trying to do that. Now, do you think much about how you look and worry about how your, you know, the way you live has anything to do with the way you look? Um, not really. Not really? Okay. How old are you now? Twelve. Twelve. So are you an athlete? Yes. And what kind of uh, sports do you do? Um, soccer, swimming, and basketball. Great. So those are things that you're growing into, and you're pretty comfortable. You get to stay active, you can stay fast, and you feel pretty good about it. How about you? Do you think about, about how you look and what you do and how that might influence it? Yeah, but I don't really like make a big deal You don't focus it. on it too yeah. much, yeah. Um, when did you start to even become aware? I mean, were there things that sort of drew your attention to what it would be like to look a certain way? Um, no. I no? Don't. You feel pretty good about it all? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's good. That's important. How about you? Um, you uh, obviously, I'm fishing for someone who's going to say, yeah, they wish they looked a little different, or they were been observing something that might influence the way they want to be when they grow up. How old are you now? Twelve. Twelve, okay. And are you pretty athletic? Yes. Yeah. So you feel pretty good about things that way? You mm -hmm. eat sensibly? You think so? Good. Well, that's good. And you, you feel right now pretty comfortable with the way you look, the way you feel about the way you look? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And you're heading into that period of time where kids sort of change. And have you thought about how you want to look as you change? You feel pretty comfortable that you're going to... I feel pretty comfortable. Yeah. But... That's good. That's important. All right. We have one back here. Yeah. And she's a beautiful cheerleader and she's an athlete. A, yeah. <laughs> she's well, my obviously, <laughs> she's your daughter. But okay. I've heard the skinny mini say she's fat certain times, oh, and a lot of the twelve-year-old okay. girls, some of the girls I've noticed still have this itty bitty childlike shape, right? And they haven't gotten their grown-up curves yet, and they haven't developed yet. And some of these girls are comparing themselves to these girls that are like 60 pounds. And to them, they think they're fat. And then when they have the muscles in their legs from being cheerleaders, from being runners, they think those legs are fat. Is it true? Does she know what she's talking about? Yeah. Yeah? So a lot of kids <laughs> at your age will start doing things that they see adults or, or older kids doing, and they'll want to look like them or be like them. What are the kinds of things that you look at? I mean, kids start to think about the way they want to appear to other people around your age, right? Mm -hmm. You're 12? Yeah. Yeah. Um, how long have you been thinking about it? 
this year? Just this year, it started to really make a difference? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's an important time. What about the modeling show? We have some specialists with us today. Um, we have a pediatrician and an eating disorders specialist, uh, Dr. Tanya Heller, who is uh, from the Center for Suburban Center for uh, the Washington, yeah, Washington Eating Center Disorders, for eating the Washington disorders. Center for Eating Disorders in Adolescent Obesity. Ginny Inglesi, who is a psychotherapist and a, and a dietitian uh, at Total Health Concepts here in Vienna, and John Almquist, who is an athletic trainer who uh, supervises the athletic training programs for the Fairfax County uh, Public Schools. Has a pretty, pretty large uh, segment of the population out there work, working with kids doing the things that we're talking about, creating their body images. What age do kids start thinking about their bodies? I've seen in our practice, I'm seeing younger and younger people, uh, younger and younger boys and girls, talk about worrying about being fat. I've seen nine-year-olds say their thighs are too big, worry about having stomachs. So it's really sad. And I think uh, the media and television, although they, it certainly is not the cause of all of this and not the cause of eating disorders, does play a big role. So when young people are especially vulnerable to some of the messages uh, given out on television, and when they're seeing these ultra-skinny models, um, they're more likely to develop an eating disorder than ever achieve that kind of ideal. Because some of these models don't even look the way they appear to look on TV. In the magazines, some of them are airbrushed. Um, some of them diet severely right before photo shoots. So it's very scary for young people, especially to be exposed to this. Did you play with Barbies when you're a little girl? Yes. Yeah, you don't play with them anymore. No. no. <laughs> now, I saw a statistic that Barbie, if you put her into adult proportions, would be somewhere close to seven feet tall, weigh about 110 pounds, have a 40-inch chest and a 20-inch waist, and would have a six-inch long neck that was about 12 inches around, which means that she couldn't hold her head up. But was the Barbie look the kind of image that you would perceive or think that you might have one day when you grow? Yes, kind of. Yeah. And what about for you? I mean, you've grown up and Barbie's been around probably <laughs> at time. least that yes. long, yeah? Um, absolutely. Yeah. Um, even, you know, when I was a teenager, you're really worried about the way you looked and you wanted to be like the skinny kids in the school when the, you know, those seemed to be the ones that were popular and everything. So there's that <coughs> pressure to try to achieve that look and right. you know not all of us have that bone structure to have that look right. so and of course probably the skinny kids they want to look bigger I mean you you have uh, you have people who come to you and talk to you about the fact that they want to look bigger and that they're trying to eat to do that do I yes um, sure and in in boys Point certainly we also see anorexia nervosa in boys not only in girls probably at least 10 percent are boys but very often they're trying to achieve a more muscular look. So you'll see some of them working out in the gym for hours a day and they're trying to get bigger and more muscular and we can talk more about that. So okay. yes, much more mm -hmm. often in boys though. Okay. And so you're a guy, you're going through that change in your life where yep. you're thinking <laughs> about it and are you thinking, I'm pretty comfortable with the way I look right now or are you thinking, you know, I saw those cuts on that guy and who was singing that rap song and dancing. Yeah, I want to get super strong. You, you know? want to get super strong, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So How do people ripped. get that way? Steroids and sometimes, sometimes though people get it naturally and that's, yeah. that's a good way to go. Yeah. So, and um, you know, there's a time when you're growing fast and you want to eat more. Do you think that you eat sensibly? Oh yeah, I, I eat pretty sensibly. Yeah. Um, what do you consider like a good fast food meal? No fast food meals. No fast food meals. That's good. That's great. Um, how about you? You do, you do do you eat to try to get bigger at all? Um. Yeah. I try to eat high levels of protein. Right. Okay. And how about yourself? You guys are all pretty lean. You're, yeah. you're, you look like you're all pretty athletic too. Are you uh, an athlete as well? Yeah. Yeah. I'm hockey, but I try to stay away from fast food and fats. Okay. Good. Well, that, that's a new trend. Uh, I guess, Jenny, you, you've probably been dealing with people who have been pretty addicted to fast foods through the years. 
in some ways they're addictive, but then others come in totally avoiding it, where we try to have a balance, though, right. because if you go to some extremes, all of a sudden, especially with the girls, they cut out all fats and all sugars, and then they become deprivation sensitive, and then they go into binge eating, and then we have a whole new disorder going right. on. When a teenager, what, what is a normal caloric intake? Mm -hmm. what, what would be a good amount of food for you know, growing, growing, guy. growing guy to eat. <laughs> I mean, they, they, do you look at calories on the size of packages and think about, well, gee, that's 1,200 that I've had so far today. I could have that many more, or you totally ignore it. Totally ignore, totally it. ignore it. Well, they probably listen to their body. They're hopefully, they're, they, some days you're hungrier than others. And when they go to eat, um, some days they're ravenous, and other days they're even more ravenous. <laughs> and uh, I have several kids your age, and they eat all the time and they're into sports and it's the same thing. And uh, with the boys, it's, there's not that concern that I see as often. We do see some uh, referrals with the uh, 12, 13 year old boys with eating disorders. But that's more rare, it's more in wrestlers and other areas of restriction. But most of the guys come in, what's my high protein? What kind of shakes? Can you help me build up? Build some muscle mass in a healthy way. They're much more conscious. Right. Well, so there are feeding cues that we have Mm -hmm. and we pay homage to them. Do you feel <coughs> like you're in touch with your own feeding cues? Um, sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, um, I try to pay attention to it more. I'm recovering from bulimia, so um, I, you know, like, when you're in the middle of an eating disorder, you're not paying attention to, um, you know, when you're hungry, when you're not. It's based on emotions rather than um, the physical hunger. Right. So, um, I mean, like, you're try you kind of try to retrain yourself almost not to go to the emotions rather than, um, rather than you know, the physical hunger cues. Right. So, you know, you try to retrain yourself, which is kind of what I'm in the process of. But. So, there are times when, I, I guess, well, let's say, when did you start thinking about food as something that affected your emotions? I mean, when did you um, start to think of it in a way that you, you felt, gee, you know, I'm starting to do this in a way that's not quite right? Um, I don't know, I kind of feel like I've always had um, disordered thoughts when it comes to eating, um, but I didn't really address the issue until maybe like three years ago I began addressing the issue and, um, you know, making steps towards like retra you know, like I said, retraining sure. to a healthy way rather than yeah. previous so habits. So this was the type of thing you remember when you were in grade school. I and mean, were you doing any activities back then, or were you doing things that? Yeah, I've, I've always feel? been pretty active. Um, I, I've always had, um, I've always been pretty active. I played soccer and basketball. You know, right. did the ballet and the gymnastics, and you know, I did a little bit of everything. But um, I never really felt comfortable with my body so so and that was you were doing gymnastics and ballet did you feel that you were too heavy to be doing it or compete with those people yeah and I mean when I was younger I was really tall I mean right. at this point you know I've stopped growing and other sure. people are growing so I'm uh, basically <laughs> average height right. but um when I was younger right. that was um I didn't I didn't see the difference between the fact that I was taller so that I, w I would be a little bit bigger than everybody else so I saw it as a weight issue rather than just the fact that you know everybody's different height, everybody's a different you know body structure and everything like right. that. So um, that was how old were you when that was going on? Um, I can remember like as early as six. Six. So you started thinking about well, from the athletic point of view, that that at six, uh, body weight, body size had something to do with it. Yeah. And that your success or your ability to achieve success. Did anybody say anything to you at any point? Do you remember a comment or? any kind of episode of someone making fun or doing something that, or anything that you remember from parents, from friends, from coaches, that influenced you, that really sort of kicked you off, that you remember? Do you remember anything like that? No, I, I mean, I, it, it was never anybody coming to me and saying, you're fat, or you right. are overweight, or you need to watch what you're eating, or anything like that. It was, from what I remember, it was something that I, like I compared myself to the people around me. Right. Okay. So, you know, it had nothing to do with people telling me, it was me, like, comparing myself. Right. And 
you started to then find ways to control what you were eating and and did you avoid certain foods or did you just get into give us a little bit of perspective on what happened um. to you as you developed this, the symptoms and I and I do this just because I want people to sort of understand how bulimia evolves for some people and obviously it doesn't evolve the same way for everyone well I mean I'd I'd avoid, you know, you avoid certain foods, you, or I, I avoided certain foods. I'd, you know, I'd be like, okay, well, I'm not going to eat any more than, you know, whatever I'd allotted myself that day. But after, you know, after a few days of that or after a few weeks of that, you're, you're, you begin to crave other things. And then you get into the binging pattern, you know, and then you're like, oh, I shouldn't have eaten all that. I, you know, I, I shouldn't have had that. And then that's when it becomes, you know, the binge purge cycle. Right. For me, that, that's how it okay. happens. Well, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a really a, an interesting phenomenon, and I would venture to say that probably a lot of girls in, in high school do that. Would you say that that's true? I, yes, I know some people who did it as I well. I mean, I think that probably everybody has some awareness of people who do experience some kind of disordered eating. Then. What do we consider disordered eating? I mean, here we've heard these guys say, I eat when I'm hungry, I eat pretty healthy, and I'll go for junk food. And then you're telling me a little bit that you would restrict like they're sort of doing sort of easily, but for you it would build up this need to have a certain type of food or to eat a volume of food that then you felt guilty about and you had to purge, right? Something Basically, like that? Yes. Basically, yes. Basically like that? Often when there's an emotional connection, yeah. Yeah. it starts off where it's not just about the food, it's tied into an emotional uh, connection, whether it's, it could be fear of, the f fear of something, but then it becomes fear of the food. It can be uh, avoiding an issue at home with parents or something, you know, it becomes avoiding the food. All of a sudden we start using food as a way to speak and manipulate food instead of using words or expressing emotions. And so the emotions get more and more repressed and the food issue gets worse and worse. And then eventually you go on a different path. Some people start with anorexia, some have anorexia and bulimia, some use compulsive eating and use it as binge eating. Some purge, some don't. It's the way they cope with their emotional um, issues. And that's a lot what we end up trying to separate the food from the feelings. And that takes a long time before you can treat the food issue. Right. Or the emotional issue. You have to separate the two. So, and you, you also, you've, you've had experience with lots of people in your life that, mm -hmm. have, that you observe and mm -hmm. that you've seen probably, you know, kids in high school and then right. even mm -hmm. as an adult. Mm -hmm. um, is there an emotional attachment to eating for you? Um, there isn't as nearly as much as there ha now as there has been, but okay. yeah, I mean, definitely it took me a long time to kind of work on separating the two, but um, yeah, definitely, and I think that happens, you know, it's so easy to kind of fall into that pattern. Do you think it's something that your parents started for you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah? Yeah. Were your parents overweight? Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. And did they have poor food choices around the house while you were growing up? Yeah, or restrictions. Um, you know, I think in my case, a lot of times legalizing, you know, we wouldn't have something in the house because somebody may binge on it. So then, right. you know, of course, then that becomes like... The obsession. The obsession, right. yeah. So definitely, so poor, just kind of poor choices all around or, you know, just kind of poor habits and, you know, just kind of filter down to myself and, you know, yeah. Were you rewarded with food when you were successful, rewarded with food mm -hmm. when you were sad? Were you... Yes. I mean, was it all mm -hmm. that food basically mm -hmm. was the emotional, I, I guess, substance. Right. It was a fuel for your emotion. It was a treat or it was like, you know, oh, you had a bad day. You know, here, have a brownie. Yeah, so definitely. So you started to become overweight at, at a very young age? No, actually adolescence. Adolescence? Mm -hmm. yeah. And And how do you perceive how that evolved? Um, I think it just kind of, as we moved, um, it just kind of filling a void. You know, I like kind of lost my support system with friends and everything, kind of starting in a new place. So I wasn't getting out as much. I didn't have as much activity. And it just was a gradual thing. You know, I just would gain a little bit of weight each year and just kind of, you know, maybe plateau occasionally, but, right. yeah. And, I mean, you know, it's, it's funny. People empathize in a very strange sort of way, but mm -hmm. only from a distance when people carry extra weight and they mm -hmm. have to deal with, with the emotions that they feel about that in and of itself. I mean, right. there's two separate sets of emotions. One is, is your internal need to eat. Right. You can't stop eating. 
Yeah, and then yeah. the other one is your perception of yourself mm -hmm. for being overweight. Right. Mm -hmm. And that can create a lot of conflict. Yeah. Uh, and people don't understand. Do you feel that people understand that? People that you meet, people that you see? Mm, not so much. I think people, you know, I, I mean, maybe I'm disconnected a little bit from it, but yeah. kind of because I'm kind of in my own world. But I think what people, I think they don't realize, like, maybe like somebody, like some of the audience members age, like 14, 15, oh, I'm so fat. And you're not fat. I mean, they're not fat. I mean, right. you know, and making comments like that. But I mean, for all the whole, I think people in, that I experienced have been, you know, just kind of sympathetic or, you know, or, um, you know, really, you know, no negative kind of. Right. Okay. Um, reaction at all. So. Well, that's good. So you've got some good ego strength there. No, I guess that's so. good. <laughs> and and you're addressing this from the point of view of your health at this yeah. point. Yeah. And uh, certainly, we give you all the support and encouragement as you could ever need for that sort of thing. But so we have two different types of <coughs> people here. One who who uh, recognize that there were ways that she used food to achieve certain comforts and then would feel guilty about that and throw up. What is bulimia and, and the concept of some of these eating disorders? Sure. Um, well, just to separate out um, disordered eating, lots of teenagers probably by definition have mm -hmm. some kind of disordered eating where they don't eat in a perfect way. But what is an eating disorder? Really, when someone has disordered eating, but in addition to that, has poor body image, maybe preoccupation with weight and shape, low self-esteem, and the most important, I think, is believe that your self-worth is tied in to how much you weigh and what you look like. So what are the eating disorders? Most of you know about bulimia nervosa. Bulimia really, um, patients with bulimia have regular episodes of binge eating, where they eat large amounts of food, usually in a discrete period of time, um, and not only once or twice, but regularly, at least twice a week, um, for three months, and then do some form of what we call either purging, trying to get rid of the excess calories, either by vomiting, using laxatives or diuretics, or other pills, or excessive exercising, or fasting. So we can talk about the dangers of this. Um, and it really doesn't serve to achieve one's goal, because often that perpetuates a cycle of binging again. Um, so that's bulimia. Not everyone with bulimia throws up. So it's the hallmark of bulimia is the binge eating and then trying to get rid of the calories. Anorexia nervosa is a, also a very serious illness where patients literally starve themselves not only to become thin, but thinner and thinner. And in effect, really never actually reach their goal. And then there's, uh, again, the body image concerns, fear of getting fat, low self-esteem. Mm -hmm. Um, but the, and binge eating disorder is also an eating disorder. So when we see people who overweight, not everyone has an eating disorder, but a certain percentage do. So maybe of people who come to us, uh, about 25 or 30 percent have an eating disorder as well, uh, where they have, similar to bulimia, regular episodes of binge eating, but don't purge, don't try and get rid of the excess calories. Um, the important thing to know is those are the eating disorders we know about, but the vast majority, maybe even up to 60 or 70 percent, have eating disorders called not otherwise specified. So have some kind of subclinical case or a, a case that doesn't meet all those criteria and it's as important and can be as serious. So these eating disorders, as we were hearing from you so eloquently, and, and it's hard to talk about these things. I know as I've discovered trying to solicit people to be on the program. It's a very private, private world that we live in with our food and our self-image. And it's very difficult to go on television and, and to try to talk about it in a way that even if we know it's helpful, even if we know it helps us sometimes, it's a hard thing to do. Um, but it starts then sometime early mm -hmm. in, in their development where they start to associate these things and they start to think that that makes them feel better. Now, have, have, you, have you dieted ever yourself excessively? No. No, you no I need to. You need I, to. Well, that's I a have good thing. That means you're comfortable with yourself, and that's a good thing on the whole, so you haven't gotten to that sort of extent. Um, right. That's what I was going to say. How about if the, can teens just eat like they did when they were children, um, like snacking all day and all of that, as long as they stay active? 
Well, and uh, on the bulimia side yes. also, um, on some of the teen movies and so forth, one of the models on one show said, um, the one heavy girl asked her, well, how do you stay so young and beautiful and so fit and beautiful? And she said, oh, that's easy. I have a finger for dessert. And we all went, ah. So that's another little. So little cues that come out in the media. Do you, do you know anybody who, who's ever made themselves vomit after eating? No, mm. at your age. I bet within a few years you will. But that, that's another question. What are some of the signs? I mean, that, since it is a pretty private thing, are there, are there things that, that parents can watch out for in their kids that might tip them off? Um, I don't know. I feel like each case is very different. Yeah. So you'd have different things to look for. Yeah. I'm, I can only speak for myself. Did, did the sorts of things in the movies or things that you read or heard about influence how you tried to do these things? Um, not particular. I mean, the media does affect, you know, like, as one, uh, as the one there was saying, um, I don't feel like it's the cause of it. It does affect it. You know, the fact that you're seeing all these people um, that are sometimes at an unhealthy weight, so thin, but they're seen as someone who's very attractive as well you know that does have an effect on people I don't I don't think it causes it but it I mean it does definitely has an effect yeah you know, it's amazing I, I read the statistic that the average model is five foot ten weighs 111 pounds and the average American female is five foot four and weighs 140 pounds it's a big difference but that's the way they were meant to be it's a pretty natural state and Russell, you meant one of yes. her response yes. to, uh, you know, when you start to eat, what age, and when does this start yes. happening? And, and a lot of the referrals that I get that the age ends up being when the kids start to get a little picky and they start getting uh, a power struggle with the food. And then all of a sudden it becomes, um, you know, mom's the gatekeeper of the food and there is this power when really the, the kid may be just trying to separate and individuate and grow. And there's this developmental stage of, 10, 11, 12, or even earlier, that starts to have a rebellious flair. And it comes out through food. And sometimes that's not always the way to control is through the food. Well, this is what you have to eat, or this is what we need to eat, or it's not time to eat. And when kids start to listen to their body and really eat when they're hungry and stop when, when they're full, and it's not about anybody else's control, that's the best way to go. So when parents come in, we spend a lot of time on legalizing and separating that you know, mom or whoever not being the gatekeeper. And it's really the, the kid trying to develop, separate, individuate, rebel, move on, and have a little power. That's part of one thing that we end up saying. Yes, go ahead. She was responding. Yes. <laughs> oh, we're responding to, <laughs> to the statements. We yes. Just, we just went away to the beach, and I packed lots of junk food, you know, different cookies, little bags of cookies, Cheetos, and all of this, and put them in a big snack bag and brought it to the beach. Now, I told them all, okay, pick three each. Okay, for the three days, one each. They were eating like three and four packs in a day. And I'm like, you know, so if they're so concerned about their bodies, how can they just eat junk food all day and night and then go, oh, you know what, though, I just, you know, I just worked out, so it's gone. I went to the track <laughs> or I went to cheerleading or I worked out, you know, I went swimming. I mean, that's a lot of intake, isn't it, with calories? Well, coming, oh, she was going to oh, respond. Sorry. You want to say something, too? <laughs> the you were there. <laughs> you were there. How many, did, how many need packages to hear her did you voice. take each day? A lot. No. <laughs> um, no, but, like, I want to know, like, how come some really skinny people can eat, like, a lot and not gain any weight, and then the regular size people eat and they gain weight? Well, that's a good question. But why, um, oh, why, why, why do some, some people, people never gain weight? Some don't. There's a tiny percent of the population, really it may be up to 4% or 1% to 4% that naturally is that uh, thin, like model thin. But most people are not that way. Um, and if you keep going that way, eating only the types of food you were talking about, people do tend to gain weight. We see um, people who overweight as well as underweight and people say, how do you treat it differently? Do you give them different messages? And actually, I think you can give a similar healthy message mm -hmm. to everyone. And what we'd like parents to tell their kids and what we want to give as a take-home message, or I do, is uh, really, first of all, 
try and focus on healthy habits rather than a certain number on the scale and rather than only a certain weight. So healthy habits, and we'll talk about that, um, really challenge the media messages you hear about thinness. And heed warning signs. If you're noticing some warning signs in yourself or others, get help. And if you want, we can talk more about those warning signs. Well, I think it's, it's reasonable since we were talking about bulimia, there are some cardinal warning signs that parents might notice. Let's say, when do you think that the most common age for that to present would be? And what are the, some of the things that they might do uh, habitually or in certain settings that might tip parent off? Bulimia tends to start a little older than anorexia, so often it's the late teens or the 20s, although it could happen at any age, where anorexia nervosa often starts in the younger teens or mid or late teens. So bulimia often a little older, but not always. Um, it can go unnoticed for years because mm -hmm. often people have normal weight. They may even be slightly overweight. So we've had people come in where parents have not been aware for many years. There's often shame involved, so it could be hidden. Um, warning signs could be finding wrappers of food you know, in the house, finding evidence of binging, um, people going into the bathrooms, taking sh long showers right after eating, uh, fluctuations in weight, and low self-esteem or depression or social isolation. And, and then, as you were saying before, finding uh, laxative packages, mm -hmm. uh, possibly uh, diuretic pills. Mm -hmm. Very uh, scary. We've got to say that as you hear about this, or you may know someone else who does this, and people will say, well, it's, I, I'm fine. I feel that it's helping me lose weight. It's extremely dangerous. So we worry about dangerous heart problems that can happen. It, it doesn't often help to achieve your goal. It can increase the cycle of binging again, and one can get permanent bowel damage. So if you're feeling like you're going along that path, it's good to ask for help. And then there are things from vomiting. People will often have teeth complaints about their their esophagus they'll mm -hmm. have burning they'll have heartburn they might mm -hmm. be on antacids or yes. get worked up for that and never have it really revealed but then if they go to a, a good dentist Teeth as you problems. say right. poor dental checkups poor yeah dental. but no, also poor dental checkups yes well another thing because if you don't eat enough you also don't lose weight right because your body need the metabolism needs something to have to lose weight and are you getting your body to use not to eat and you don't lose weight? You can get, get only sick. Well, that becomes right. a frustration when the more people try to diet and deprive, yes. their metabolism slows, they're not seeing the results, and then as a result, later on, they start to binge anyway because they can't maintain that exactly. deprivation. Yeah. But the excessive exercise uh, with bulimia, too, that we, we often see, two, three hours a day of, of excessive exercise. And, and John, I will be patient. Well, He's and we have some guys here just to say, you know, the frustration you have with eating and then gaining weight. Well, these guys can eat until there's no food left in the house, <laughs> and they're out running around and they're in that growth spurt right now. But if they continue to eat like that as adults, uh, it won't. They won't be treated so kindly usually, any which way. But you're involved in in elite sports. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a hockey instructor out of Rasta. Okay, and you have athletes who probably like to eat a lot. Do you, do you have any athletes that you suspect they're disordered in the way they eat? Um, well, a lot of times you run these camps and you see it a lot with children. Uh, you know, parents will give them money for the day to buy food and these kids just, you know, buy candy. I think, I think that's part of it is that at a young age now, kids are just getting too much sugar in them. I mean, there's a, I, I heard one statistic one time where only 1% of children have a healthy diet. I think parents really need to start addressing it at a younger age with their kids because so many kids end up, you know, having diabetes because of this high uh, sugar intake at a young age. Well, and bulimia, uh, for John Almquist, uh, the question is, bulimia is not just something that, that girls do in private. As an athletic trainer, you have to encounter it. There are sports that, yeah. that guys do that Wrestling has been one of the big uh, targeted sports that has a lot of eating disorder or a lot of disordered eating, right. and some actually evolve into eating disorders that they they start at a younger age in wrestling. They start wrestling in high school, and then they uh, learn that pattern and get in that habit, and that becomes a problem. Um, I think one of the things you know, we in high school we deal with all kinds of issues, not only the overweight and sedentary, but also the very active, and we also deal with the athlete that wants to to get the rip look and, and we also deal with the athlete that wants to run the quickest mile and uh, so there's all different types of supplements that are that are on the table as well 
So, you know, the combination of all the, the uh, different things available between the media, the magazines, the internet now is a, is a big re, uh, resource for getting not only good information but very in, inappropriate information. So I think some of the things that we're dealing with from the high school perspective is from the young girls, uh, as was mentioned earlier, this, they're starting the disordered eating and eating disorders earlier and they have a pretty good hold on it when they get to the high school. Um, what we see, some of the things that we look for are um, issues with performance uh, because obviously when you, you have poor nutrition, your performance will suffer. But if you're already an elite athlete or very good at your sport and you get into a high school team and most likely you can eat candy six days a week and probably still beat the second stringer and if you are truly a gifted athlete. So that's one of the things that is a little bit hard sometimes to judge is the performance really uh, going downhill. Right. Um, so you really have to look at each individual and uh, education is a very important concept not only to the kids but also the parents and the coaches with regard to what is good nutrition. And when we deal with kids that we suspect having an eating disorder uh, that needs to take it to the next level. Our intervention, our first line of intervention is to get them involved with a, a specialist like Dr. Heller or Jenny with regard to an, a real good way of looking at this is what, is, what, is, what do you need to, to perform at your best? What is a good nutritional diet? And you really, nowadays with so much stuff on the market, you need a nutritionist to break it down. But you have to be dedicated. If you want to eat to win, uh, and truly go to that next level. Uh, it takes a lot of effort on everybody's part, especially the athlete's part. And one of the things we recommend is, is track your food intake for five days. Write every single thing you, you eat down on a piece of paper and then take it to someone who actually can look at it and evaluate what the nutritional content and value is. And then they can make those minor adjustments to, make, to, to give you the best um, formula uh, you may need to only adjust something, and most likely it's not going down to a store and buying supplements. It's basically by, uh, adjusting what mom cooks and puts on your table, and that's probably and what you can get in a grocery store, not a um, nutritional store or, or a uh, supplement store. So those are some of the strategies that we use. You know, there are certain sports that seem to be more, uh, let's say, prone to eating disorders than others, obviously. Team sports, do you find kids on sports teams, I mean, when I think of sports teams, I think of football and I think of the linemen and I think of them eating gross amounts of food to try to put on weight. Gross amounts of anything to put on mass. Okay. To put and, on and mass. Yeah. And, and again, that, that sometimes sends the wrong message because what they, unfortunately, some of the coaches just want mass instead of strength. Mm -hmm. And they aren't usually as good a, an athlete as someone who actually puts on muscle. Right. So you do have to go back to what are you putting in your body? What are you using as fuel? And then are you actually working out enough to reap the benefits? Right. Um, and, and that's another the, the problems with the supplements is everybody wants a shortcut. Right. And truly, there is no shortcut to getting to become a good athlete. You have to work hard, and that hard work takes time, and it hurts. Yeah. And uh, that's one of the things you really have to get into. But then you, you go to those solo sports, like you were saying, wrestling, uh, gymnastics. Mm -hmm. um, cheerleading now. Diving, is, cheerleading. cheerleading. Competitive cheerleading. Those kinds of yeah. mm -hmm. problem with that. So there's an issue you have to be light if people are going to throw you up in exactly. the air. Exactly. <laughs> and you have <laughs> to have you. strength right. if you're going to be expected to catch that person. Right. And we see so many injuries uh, f when they can't catch the person because they're, f right. they're fatigued. And uh, you know, it may be because they aren't getting enough uh, energy uh, to be able to maintain that long practice schedule. And then they're trying to catch them and they drop them because they can't, uh, can't, can't catch them anymore. So. You're an athletic trainer at, um, <coughs> at Oakton at High School. Oakton High School. Okay. And I guess you deal with the whole, the whole, I guess the whole gamut of athletes there. Correct. Um, I, I read incredible things about wrestlers and what they go through. Right. Um, both in terms of sweating, restricting food, uh, inducing vomiting, and all those kinds of things. I mean, right. do you have do you have kids who have gone through those kinds of experiences? Yeah. You feel? Or do you yeah, have a program set up that helps to prevent that? Absolutely. The the VHSL has a program that's mandated by the National Federation. At every state now has a program that monitors their body weight, their body fat, and their their hydration status before the season starts. Right 
that calculates what's the lowest weight they can go at 7% body fat. And then it figures out a, a weekly weight percent weight that they can weigh each week that they can weigh in at. And we give that to the coaches and we help the coaches out with ways to meet those weights. And yeah, there there's still the wrestlers that are sweating out, but it, it is it's illegal to wear the rubber suits and the plastic bags and the saunas, that all those are illegal. But it still happens. Um, but I, I don't think it's as bad as it used to be. I mean, I was a wrestler, and we did some really weird stuff. Yeah. So, you know, think times have changed, so but it still just happens. it's not as bad as it used to be. Oh, no, it's not as bad as it used to be. <laughs> okay. We did some really bad things. But, uh, yeah, it, it still happens, but I don't think it's as bad as it used to be. Right. One of the things that, I, uh, that was mentioned about the bodies breaking down um, is also the stress fractures right. and the amenorrhea, especially in women, um, as, as they're not getting enough nutrients and they're still exercising so much, Physically, the body's breaking down. We're seeing a lot of stress fractures, right. repetitive stress fractures, and that's usually a sign for me to look out for. Right. Well, that's the athlete triad. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> trying to tell us a little bit about what uh, that the is. The female athletic triad, exactly mm -hmm. what you said. Um, when they over exercising, they lose their menstrual periods, and osteoporosis is the other thing, or bone thinning, bone density loss. So um, that's an issue, and I, I agree with what you said. We've seen um, several people um, develop eating disorders um, f from wrestling, so they had to make weight for wrestling and then develop binge eating or other problems afterwards. I think it has improved a whole lot. We're not hearing about this as much. People ask us also, what's the difference between an Olympic athlete and um, someone with an eating disorder who over-exercises? And the person, an Olympic athlete, will never work out to the detriment uh, to, to harm their health. They, well, they usually will not. Whereas someone with an eating disorder has obligatory act. They've got to keep going to the point where those kinds of things might even develop. Mm -hmm. So, and that's a pattern of exercise uh, that's interesting. You have elite athletes who are training for their sport, and you have people who aren't really participating at that level, but they will <clears throat> get up in the morning and spend two hours on a a stationary bike or go to the gym and go on a treadmill. They'll go to school and then at the end of the day they'll go back to the gym uh, saying that they're getting in shape. Well, nobody has to get in shape that way. Is it, would you say that's true for the Abs ordinary individual? Absolutely. So, uh, sometimes just walking around the block, walking your dog around the block is enough exercise to burn off some of the calories that they're taking in. So that, that's another warning sign, I guess, for parents uh, mm -hmm. if their kids are And are if doing we can think thing. about not only as burning of calories, but rather focusing again on health and fitness rather than only on burning calories and on a specific weight. So thinking about becoming healthy and becoming fit. Right. And then we can talk more about how to achieve that. Do you have a lot, you're, you're also in the, in the elite hockey? Uh, yes, I'm also a hockey instructor. Yeah. Do you have a lot of kids who are playing hockey who are taking supplements? Uh, a lot of the kids we see come in are, are from the age of probably 14 and under right. uh, that Paul and I uh, mm -hmm. see come in. So they're not really informed about, they know there's supplements out there. They've seen, you know, really big guys, right. you know, wrestlers and stuff like that, and hockey players. But they don't really know about sort of the supplement world. Oh, I can take protein and, and creatine and, and all these things right. uh, to get bigger. They're not really focused on that. They're, they're there for, for the game. So, John, are there supplements that are routinely recommended at the high school level? Actually, uh, no. Okay. Uh, one of the federation, National Federation of High Schools as well as the Virginia High School League has a, um, uh, they basically state that no coach shall endorse, supply, recommend, or provide any supplement, nutritional supplements. Okay. So that is one of the rules that we go by in Fairfax County Schools. And um, I think that's the safest thing because one of the things we do know is that in the supplement world, we don't know what's in them. Uh, th there's a lot of uh, uh, mysterious substances, and they don't have to have all the ingredients actually lab on the label. So that becomes another problem. Right. So they're not FDA approved. Yes. What about all the What about all the protein shakes that they recommend the kids have? I mean, not coaches per se at schools, but say at private gyms, they recommend having a protein shake after their workout that it helps them. They also helps them meet their bottom line. <laughs> they Do they, sell, what they also say. sell that protein shake? No, that it restores their energy yeah, that they just... I know that, right. But, and, but they're selling them to you. I, have yeah. you ever walked into a GNC and had exactly somebody right. say, oh, you don't need any supplements. You don't need any, any nutritional supplements. You get all the vitamins. What do you eat every day? Oh, that's the 18-year-old expert will tell you you need everything. Right. 
Yes. I think, I mean, the real bottom line is if you, after an activity, it is recommended to refuel. And so I think out of a convenience, on the go, crazy stress society we're in, people are grabbing whatever they can. If we had packed a healthy snack after activity or had some to go thing um, for the kids, they'd eat that too. They're, you know, they're hungry or we're hungry. I know after working out, we all need something to fuel. But not necessarily we have to get some uh, great protein shake. Uh, you can get protein in a lot of other food sources. You also have to be aware of how much exercise they're actually getting, how much energy they are they actually burning, and how much do they really need to take in. I mean, that goes, all goes back to calories in, calories out. Um, if you don't gain weight, if you, your calorie caloric intake equals your caloric expenditure. What are some healthy snacks that these kids could eat after a game or after a gymnastics meet or um, something where they're just exhausted and wiped out? And that first impulse is to go for the sugar, that quick fix. But what, what would be some good choices for them to go and, and have ready to eat to refuel? And I think, uh, as you said, when someone's uh, after exercise, pretty low blood sugar, so they're looking for something as right. a pickup. And they always say within 15 minutes, try to grab something with some carbs in. But also, I like to let them also have some kind of protein and carb combination right afterwards so that they can not only get the carb level up and glycogen loading, but also get some protein so that they can maintain blood sugar until they can get to have their next meal. So you're looking at, um, you know, people have peanut butter and apple, people have cheese and crackers. There's any kind of protein carb combination, nuts and fruit. It's personal preferences, you know, I kind of ask them what they enjoy, some kind of carb, some kind of protein that they can carry, portable, grab, it's convenient. Because Trail mix is a yeah, popular one. Yeah, that's another one. Because you're out and about and then there's repetitive meets or repetitive games and sports and you're hanging on fields forever sometimes and you need things with you. Yeah, and that's an interesting concept because a lot of people carb load, mm -hmm. they feel that carbs are what they want, they want to drink their sugar drinks, uh, whether it's Gatorade or a soda or a juice. Um, but they're not necessarily reaching for something with protein. And right. I think that, that they end up with a really disturbed sense of, of hunger because that sugar only lasts for so long. Right. And they 30 minutes, 45 minutes, all of a sudden now they're crashing again. They're looking for another pickup. Maybe that's where they grab the pretzels then, and then they grab another Gatorade. Or they grab, and all they're doing is kind of carb uh, right. up and down uh, right. with their blood sugar for a couple hours. Now, there's still, you, you have a lot of, of kids who think, okay, well, you were saying before, you want to get those cuts? Oh yeah, I want to be ripped. You want to be ripped. And, and <laughs> you know, I can't blame you. And all you need is two or three Six. pictures <laughs> and you can show them to people for the rest of your lives and say, I used to look like that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. Which is what most of us even wish we could do, but really can't. Um, but the fact is that, that people think that supplements will do that for them. Do you think that you can buy this in a store? and that'll help you work out and will make that workout more productive? I think you could, but you would have to maintain that and keep using it, which would then be unhealthy for you and would result in something worse happening yeah. for your health. I, you know, when I think about it, I think about athletes who, who do start on the road with supplements and keep looking in the mirror and keep thinking, you know, I thought that was big yesterday, but it really isn't that big, and look at that guy over there. Um, and they're, it's a gateway to me to the next level of, of muscle building, which is steroids. Uh, do you see that in the high schools? Do you see kids who are obviously, I mean, there is a fairly significant and clear body type that's using steroids. Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't think we see a lot of the steroid, true steroid abusers in high school. I think when we, we do see it, it's at the, now, this, in this day and age. Years ago, we did. Um, but this day and age, I think we may see a little bit of a, a, a blip in that uh, scheme as the athlete finishes his high school career and then is, is truly an elite athlete and is being recruited by the Division I colleges. And they are then preparing for the next level of competition, which is the D1 college then they may get into that. I don't, see we, I don't think we see that a lot, at least the, in the conversations we've had with the 50 athletic trainers that work with our 25 high schools. We don't see a lot of it in, in during the season, but we do see it in, in, in the males. In the females, uh, we don't see steroid abuse. It's, it's more the eating disorders right. that we, uh, we look at there. Yeah, there's always been talk of screening uh, high school athletes for steroid use. Yeah. Is that still just talk? 
uh, financially until the state comes down with some finances to actually fund it like they have in Texas and New Jersey has a program. Uh, but the, Virginia did come out with a law last year or two years ago that um, basically if uh, anybody is uh, caught with uh, taking steroids during a season, they are suspended from athletics for two years. And if they're a senior, that extends into their college. So it is a fairly hefty um, uh, price, to pay. price to pay. Sure. Um, so do you discourage people from going out and getting these tubs of, of protein and, and Absolutely, and I think one of the things that was kind of mentioned here uh, in a roundabout way is that, yes, you do need certain nutrients at certain times, and you need to make sure that the nutrients that you take into your system are good and they equal what you need. Um, but you could probably get all those with regular food. Uh, and the only reason you need that protein shake is because your lifestyle is so hectic or so busy for a period of time, but you don't need to live on that protein shake every day. It's maybe during the one, the, the weekend soccer tournament where you have three or four soccer games in one day right. to refuel for the next game, but not during Monday through Friday. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the issues where you get into a habit and that's all you start eating. And really the, you're getting better nutrient if, nutrients if you eat real food. And variety. And a variety. And you were saying that there are males who do have the same kind of eating disorders that do have bulimia, as you were saying with the wrestlers, but are there males who aren't athletes who are, are doing those kinds of things as well? Who have other kinds of eating disorders yes. like anorexia yep. or bulimia? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, probably about 10% of people uh, with anorexia and bulimia are males. We don't see them as often for many reasons. There's a lot of embarrassment in some about having a, an illness that was thought to be a female disorder, right. which it is not. Second thing, they don't get the clinical signs is they don't lose period. Right. So, so they're often not brought to attention, so many doctors don't even recognize mm -hmm. it. And thirdly, many treatment centers don't treat men. Hmm. So that's really sad. So it's interesting, when, if you have a, a lean adolescent girl and you're wondering why she's getting so thin, uh, you might try to make sure that she's having her periods on a regular right. basis mm -hmm. because they can lose that, that body weight in a certain way that will impinge upon their hormonal production. And upon their sports late, their ability to play sports at increased risk for fractures right. and walking this way and it doesn't end up well. Often. So the, the hormones are important in terms of the cycles for calcium as well as the fact that they'll often restrict calcium. And hormones can be affected in boys too. Yes. Yeah, you look athletic. Um, somewhat. Somewhat athletic, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, and I know this, you know, we, we got on a little tangent here, but I know that, that you, you have experienced some of, of what um, we're talking about here. And uh, you look pretty healthy right now. You feel pretty healthy? Um, better than I was. Better than you were? Yeah. And what kind of issues were you dealing with? Uh, kind of the gamut. I started out with uh, anorexic issues and that What's interesting is that I was restricting food and I got to the point where I just kind of snapped and started binging on food. And I actually gained about 50 pounds. Huh. So I went from being underweight to just about overweight. And then finally started, you know, being okay with not having, you know, a whole box of cookies every day. And it normalized itself to like more normal weight for me where I didn't have to do that. Right. When you were really restricting, uh, did you did you perceive yourself as being too thin? No, yeah. never. No, I always thought I could be thinner. So you know, would you always talk about it? Gee, I can't believe. You know, it's I wouldn't talk about it though. Yeah. It was such a, a personal thing, and that's a shame because I think now, when looking back on it, that just people don't talk about it enough. Right. And so many people probably are going through it, but when you're that age, you don't think that they are. You just think that everyone around you is naturally thin and you have to work for it. Right. So. Okay, uh, Dr. Heller, if, if we had to give advice um, to the parents in our audience mm -hmm. as to how to monitor their kids, make sure that they're doing okay. I know that you've, you've written a few books and actually, we have them right here, um, things that people could probably get on, on the internet themselves, mm -hmm. Amazon.com or one sure. of those types of places, eating disorders and overweight. 
So you deal with the, the full with gamut. Both. And I think it's really important to know again that you can give a similar healthy message um, to everyone. And I think it's important for parents uh, to start early. People say, how soon should we start? You were talking about this to some extent. And I think you start at birth. At birth, a kids really perceive, are very perceptive. They'll perceive what parents are doing. They'll hear if a dad makes a comment to a mom, like you're getting a little chubby, you've got love handles or whatever. They'll hear that and, and internalize some of this. So the body image concerns of the parents are often taken in by the kids as well. So start very young, teaching healthy habits, um, modeling healthy behaviors, and they'll pick some of that up, eating three meals a day and snacks. So avoid restrictive dieting, um, strive for health and fitness rather than thinness, uh, watch warning signs in the kids, and really teach them that who they are as people um, is not the same as how much they weigh and what they look like. So value yourself for who you are, and it's not the same as how much you weigh. So we, we've had some great experts here. Uh, John Omquist, uh, athletic trainers, Fairfax County Public Schools. Remember that these are people who you have access to, and we want you to know that, that they are professionals at what they do, and they look out for your kids, and they're there to answer your questions and to help you and your children be healthy and good athletes. And, you don't even have to be in the athletic programs other than as a student to, to get their, uh, their help, their knowledge, whatever. Dr. Heller, uh, you, uh, you have your center in Bethesda. We have the, if you wanted to go on the website, it's WashingtonCenterOnline.com. And there's another nice uh, resource, NIDA, the National Eating Disorders Association. That's NationalEatingDisorders.org. Right. And I'll stay afterwards if any of you want that. And Jenny, Jenny and Glacey, uh, Total Health Concepts in Vienna, psychotherapy, and uh, you can work with people in figuring out their diets. And I want to thank everybody for being with us. I want to thank you for uh, viewing with us tonight. And until the next time, I'm Dr. Russell Libby looking out for your health.